I'm just finding out though, wow, we have some bass available apparently. <laughs> Whoa. Wow, that's, I don't think we've tested the limits of it yet. That was somewhat of the limits. Well, hi, my name is Matt. I am one of the pastors here. I am excited to be with you this morning. Uh, if this is your first Sunday and I met a few of you already, welcome. Uh, this is Roswell Community Church. Again, give me a little opportunities to connect over the next couple of Sundays. Really excited about that. But again, hang around, meet some new people. Um, that would be fantastic. Uh, we have been, over the course of this past year, in a series where we're reading the entirety of the scriptures together. That's all of the Bible together, and we're, we're coming on to the end of it. Uh, we've been in the epistles now for a few weeks, and, and over the course of our time in the epistles, which are the letters that were written after the death of Jesus, explaining a little bit of what's going on in the church as it's growing up, as it's trying to understand what is this reality, we've been kind of focusing each week on one particular area that relates to the Christian life. We focused on some of the, the biblical theology, some of those foundational theologies of like justification and sanctification. And in the last couple of weeks, we've been focusing on some of the foundational biblical principles of the Christian life. Things like Christian freedom or kind of what does the, the Christian life in the spirit look like? Uh, what are Christian virtues like, like, like Thanksgiving in particular? And then next week, we're going to be looking at Christian citizenship. But this week, we're going to take a few minutes and look at Christian leadership. Christian leadership and in particular, both the characteristics and the responsibilities centered around this idea of elders or overseers or pastors in particular. Now, if this is your first Sunday and like, or maybe just you're recent to like the faith, you just, you're visiting a church, you're not sure about it. And you hear for the first time that churches have elders. You may think if you're not familiar with it, it's like some kind of like Jedi council or something, you know, everyone's got a cloak, you know, and there's some hidden lightsabers of some sort, you know, biblical lightsabers of some sort. And that's not exactly what it's like. I had a, a, someone that was at church for a while and I remember they were, they were new to the church and, was, and, and they, I said, hey, so what, what did you think originally when you, when you heard the idea of elders? And they were like, I thought it was like a group of wizards. You know, like, like the, the elders, you know? And again, for, if you've grown up in the church, it's like, of course there's elders and deacons. It's like a normal thing. But if you're not part of the church, like you're new to this thing, it could sound weird. It can sound peculiar. Now, if you are not new to the church, you've been around, you probably have one of two experiences centered around like leadership in the church and eldership and pastors. And, and that's either it's been really, really good. And you've been able to trust people. They've been able to serve you and love you and meet you in times of crises. And it's been really, really positive. And, and for others of you, you've had bad experiences. You've actually been wounded in particular by church leadership in a way that's been like, that's stuck with you that you, you kind of have to still work through today. Maybe you showed up recently to our church, or maybe you've been here for a while, and it's still challenging to trust. Because when you're dealing with leadership, if you're dealing with authority, and with authority, there can be, of course, violations of that authority and that trust. And that can be really painful. There can be spiritual, even abuse. It goes all the way. So there's bad stories of leadership. So this, the answer, of course, to, to bad spiritual leadership is not no spiritual leadership, right? It's good spiritual leadership. And that is what we want to talk about this morning. So, without further ado, we're going to step into 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 7. Hear the word of the Lord. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how can he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into the snare of the devil. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, as I said, the, the, the biblical word for, for elder, pastor, overseer, there's all kind of basically talking about one particular office throughout the entirety of the, of the New Testament. And at Roswell Community Church, if you come to the newcomers, we'll talk a little bit more about this. But at Roswell Community Church, we are an elder-led church. It's not a new idea. It's actually been around in the, Old, in the New Testament for a long time and churches throughout the history of the church. And so we're going to look this morning at how biblical leadership works. But 
let me open with kind of an opening perspective. You just heard the passage I read there, right? You listened to it? You read it on the screen? One of the things that's been kind of noteworthy by commentators and pastors over the years is how unremarkable this list is. I think D.A. Carson said it's exceptionally unexceptional as a list. Now, I'm not saying it's not a good list. I'm just saying it's, it seems to be kind of unremarkable. Everything on that list, honestly, ought to be the, the very thing that's true of every believer. This is not a magic list. Every element that's outlined throughout the scripture is, well, visible here. Everything that's here is visible elsewhere in the scripture. Let me give you an example. Let's say hospitality, right? It said hospitable. Well, hospitality is explicitly laid out in Hebrews chapter 13 for everyone. We are to be, as Christians, hospitable people. Or let's say having a good reputation to outsiders. That's one of the things that was just read. Well, all believers, according to Colossians 4 and 1 Thessalonians 4, are supposed to have a good reputation with outsiders. The bar is not set at some stratospheric level. It's not, listen, if you're going to be an elder, you have to be like some kind of super Christian person. Not at all. The kind of person who, you know, walks into the room and has to like, you know, hide themselves because the Shekinah glory of the Lord is like pierces everyone, you know. It's not that kind of thing. Oh, Shekinah glory is the Old Testament thing that Moses did, in case you didn't know. No, that's not what it looks like. This is just a list of characteristics that are true of every believer to some measure and, Lord willing, in increasing measure. So, elders are not some kind of enlightened elitist group. There are certain functions and certain uh, callings that are set up in it, but they're just people, just Christians. The prime characteristic is just consistency of character and Christian behavior. That's it. So what we're talking about here is whatever ought to be true as a standard of Christian living, well, it needs to be particularly true and exemplified in the life of an elder, but that's it. So, if ordinary Christians are not to be beating up on people, if ordinary Christians are supposed to be hospitable, supposed to have their family be something that's disposing itself towards flourishing, if the normal Christian life is people who are not lovers of money, well, then their leaders should most exemplify that reality, but not alone. So, this list presumes that these characteristics are true and consistent and predominantly present in the life of a Christian leader. This person stands out because he is not the exception to the Christian life, but is living it out with consistency and normal Christian existence. So what this means is that if we're going to walk through these things, you don't get to check out. You don't get to go like, cool, well, hopefully the elders are like this. So hopefully future elders will be like this. But this is actually pointing out, what Paul's pointing out in this passage is like, hey, so this is what it means to be a mature believer. This is the direction, the aspiration, the longing of what it means to be a maturing man or woman in Christ. And so this morning you're invited and called towards more Christ-likeness, more maturity, not just be checking a box to make sure are the elders, are the pastors, are the overseers doing what they're supposed to be doing. So that being said, Let's look at this. I'm going to interject you in the midst of this all the way through. We're going to look at who are elders, what elders do, and then lastly, how do we respond? So who are elders, what do they do, and how do we respond? Well, first of all, who are elders? Elders are a plurality. We didn't read it in this passage. It's strewn throughout the entirety of the New Testament, but the consistent pattern throughout the New Testament is that each body of believer is shepherded by a plurality of God-ordained elders. Simply said, this is the only clear pattern, it seems, for church leadership in the New Testament. Nowhere in the scriptures does it give you, you find a, a local body of believers that's ruled by majority rule or by a single pastor. You just don't find it. So plurality is the norm, is the way of doing Christian leadership according to the New Testament. So, elders are to be a plurality. One. Two, they're men. 
Now that's either a record scratch for you, or it's like, right? And I suspect it's probably true in the room that we have probably a little bit of both of those. The good news is, is that two years ago, almost to the day, I didn't, took an entire Sunday morning and we focused primarily on what it means and what it looks like to be a man, to have the role of a man, and particularly the role of women within the church. And we talked about it extensively. Now, it's the most downloaded sermon on our, on our website. I don't know if you guys were aware of that. I don't know why, but it is. And uh, it's really, really important. Now, again, I would have to take an entire sermon just to talk through this particular dynamic, so I'm not going to do that, but I really encourage you to go back. If you haven't yet, or if you weren't here when we preached through that, this really, really mattered. It was really significant to understand what this looks like and why and how we understand the reality of God ordaining a particular set of roles to men, and particularly the office of elders. I'm going to read from the RCC Statement of Faith, just so you have it clear here. It says... In the ministry of the church, both men and women are encouraged to serve Christ and to be developed to their full potential in the manifold ministries of the people of God. The distinctive leadership role of preaching and eldership within the church given to qualified men is grounded in creation, fall, and redemption and must not be sidelined by appeals to cultural developments. So, it's a really important thing. But it's something that I'm going ahead and set aside and invite you to be able to think about in light of what we've talked about in the past. What we understand as a church, what we believe as a, as a leadership, and what we understand theologically is that, that, that elders and pastors are to be men. It is actually the only office that seems to be reserved to men. And honestly, I can't, I can't think of a less popular perspective, but, seemingly, but, but it is in light of the keeping of the scripture what we understand to be true. And we actually think it's not just true, but it's good, part of the good heart of God. I spent some time just rereading that sermon from a couple of years ago. And like my heart was moved not only towards the reality of how difficult this can appear and can seem and can be to work through, particularly as a woman, um, but also the goodness of God and his intent and purpose. So I'm going to leave that alone right now. I want to say more, but we're going to leave that alone. So plurality of leadership of men aspiring to lead, to serve, really. Men who desire, it says, to aspire for a noble task in the local congregation. So what is this, what are the characteristics? What are the qualifications? What does this look like? Well, it says the first one, and this is probably the most umbrella-like of the characteristics, says above reproach. This is maybe the one that captures all the others underneath it. It's not, this doesn't mean perfection. I mean, you know that's true. <laughs> It's not perfection, no. But it's it's beyond legitimate, substantiated accusations. That if there's a complaint, like it doesn't stick because it's not actually consistent with reality. This means you can't be the kind of guy, can't be the kind of person that by his life shames the gospel and the community. There's no obvious, constant, or consistent flaw in character or behavior that everyone knows about, but no one talks about. No one's willing or able to bring it forward, to reproach that person on. No, no, instead, above reproach means consistent in character. So that's kind of the umbrella one when we talk about what it means to step into, to be an elder, to be a leader in a Christian leader. But really, there's, a, there's kind of a breakdown of everything else into three fundamental categories. And really, we have the home life, the personal life, and the spiritual life. And so we're going to buzz through this. And again, this applies to every single person sitting here. The home life, the personal life, and the spiritual life. Paul says, be the home life. First, husband of one wife. Husband of one wife. Simply said, this is a one-woman man. For you in your personal life, it's a, a husband of one wife, a wife of one husband, a one spouse man or woman. It's dedicated and given to a wife, his own wife. A vision of, of restoring the original purpose for man and woman in, in Adam and Eve, committed to one unto death. Does it mean you can't have an elder that's single? pastor that's single? Of course not. Paul was single. Jesus was single. So, no, it's not like, hey, you have to be married in order to be able to assume leadership in the church. Not at all. It's been debated over the years. 
But if you're single, it means you're living a one man, one woman kind of life. So a husband of one wife. Secondly, verse 4, it says, he must manage his household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. It means you lead well in the home. Manages well, supervises and, and nurtures. Not a tyrant, not a dictator. Beautifies and causes the family to flourish. Children in this family, it says they're going to obey and with proper respect. That doesn't mean that your kids don't have attitudes. Doesn't mean that you don't have rebellious kids at times, of course. But it means that he treats his children with such respect that they honor him likewise with respect. Someone who's in control of their home, even when there's difficulty with kids. And we've all had difficulty with kids if we've had them long enough. But why does this matter? Well, verse 5 tells us, it says, For if anyone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? This is just simple prerequisite, right? If you can't handle the things in your own home, how are you going to handle the church? If you can't lead your home, serve your children, discipline them, and train them, if you can't serve and sacrifice for your spouse, for your wife, how are you going to do so for the body of Christ? How are you going to do that? Fam larger family of believers. Now listen, not, not, not all are eligible to be elders in the church, but all are called to be leaders, to be influencers, to be character makers in their home. All. Husband of one wife, manage household well. So that's, that's home life. What about personal life? What this person's like when in private What's their, what's their inner life like? What's your inner life like? Well, the real measure of a person, I heard a pastor say, is not the public faces, but it's the quiet closet of their own souls. And what Paul does is he takes four positives and four negatives. And what's interesting is if you take the four positives and you lay them on top of the four negatives, they kind of speak to the opposite of the other. Not perfectly, but actually relatively well. Verse 2, the end of verse 2, it says, this is the positive. That a mature Christian, a Christian leader, an elder, is to be sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable. Sober-minded. This just means temperate, right? Clear-headed. Self-possessed. This means someone who's not an extremist. He's not carried away by any passions that are just swarming around sober in their mind. Second is self-control. There's someone exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit who's under control, who's, whose life is orderly and not out of control. Respectable. This just means well-behaved, dignified. As people see your life, as people look in on your interactions, it breeds respect. It generates respect from those who look in, who see. Hospitable. This means a lover of strangers. This is someone who engages the lost world around him. And this isn't just about like making a salad, being able to host a dinner, okay? It doesn't mean less than that necessarily, but it doesn't mean only that. As someone who understands that all that they've been given has been given to them in order for them to engage the world and the community, to, to invite the lost into their world, into their home. So it means not being a hermit. It means not isolating from people, but being open with your home and your life to those on the outside. This is honestly probably one of the hardest ones for me. As a pastor and elder, I'm mostly dealing with Christians all the time. You know, you people. Um, and uh, it's great. I love it. But this is not a strength for me anyway. That's never been a super strength for me. Actually, one of the gifts that Becky's been to me over the years is that she's someone who draws people all in. And one of the things we're looking forward to in the midst of moving into a new neighborhood is just that, is actually being able to begin again. We live 19 years on the same street with almost all the same people. And we invited them, and then it just got familiar. Sound familiar to you? 
It's the coworkers that have been with you for forever. Some of you are starting new jobs. Some of you are trying new churches. You know, like this is an opportunity to potentially look at this and say, hey, what does it look like? That's what I'm looking at right now. A friend of strangers, a lover of strangers. So those are the four positives. And the four negatives are laid underneath them. It says, first of all, not a drunkard, right? Which would be an opposite of sober-minded. See how that happened? How sober is the opposite of drunkard? It's okay. You can ooh and ah. It's fine. You can. This isn't just drunkenness, right? We're talking addictiveness, right? This is addiction, whether it's chemical dependency or any other. The reality is this, that the slave of Jesus cannot be a slave to anything else, to anyone else. So not a drunkard. It says then not violent, but gentle. Not violent because they're self-controlled. This is, this is really a big deal, especially when it comes to leadership. Leadership can fail by its passivity or by its aggression. And, and many of you who've been damaged by leadership have been damaged right here. It means to not be aggressive or threatening or manipulative, spiritually manipulative even. Not being a bully, not throwing your weight around, especially not throwing your spiritual authority around. Misusing power. So not violent, but gentle, self-controlled. Thirdly, not quarrelsome. Not, not prideful in a way that's argumentative and, and a disposition of the spirit that just wants to argue and fight, being contrarian consistently, arguing for argument's sake. It's, it's not even arguing for theology's sake. Now, you may be good to articulate and talk about the realities of our faith, absolutely, but not doing so from a disposition of argumentativeness or contention, a confrontation mentality, the yes, but, harboring resentment and you know, taking things really, really personally, and so now you're going to get my argument. And the last one is not a lover of money, which stands opposed to hospitality. Remember, it's everything I have is given to me for the purpose of being able to invite people, to meet people in the midst of where they are and to love them as strangers. A leader, a Christian leader, cannot be primarily motivated by the pursuit of wealth for themselves, for their pleasures, for their appetites. Can't be longing primarily for comfort. Rather, a commitment with what God has provided and a contentment there, not a greediness, not an obsession with a hyper-focus on security or on affluence. How you doing? How's, how, how are you doing with, with your family life? How, how are you doing with your personal life? As I said, this, this is not super Christian stuff. This is just the mark of what it means for someone to walk in the Spirit, to listen to God, to become more and more mature by the working of God's work in us over time. And it's supposed to be manifested and exemplified in key and true leaders in the church. It's all of us moving in this direction. And so, are you quarrelsome? Maybe this is the invitation God has for you to be like, you know, what would it look like for that to subside? To not have to be right. To not have to be seen as right. To not have to win. Are you violent? Do you lose your temper? Do you want to crush people if they don't agree with you? It's an invitation, a moment to say the progressive movement of God in our lives invites us to a different story. Well, last thing briefly is in our spiritual life. This is what someone is like in their walk with God. It says, verse 2, able to teach. This is a pronounced ability to open the word of God to the people of God. Titus, and we'll see that in a second, says, holds firm. He asks, tells elders to hold firm to the teaching and the gospel. 
is the ability to handle the word, to, to explain its meaning, to sit down with someone and be able to walk through the gospel and how it, the, the, the tenets and the realities of our faith work themselves out in our life. It's the ability to apply God's word into a situation that someone's facing in their life. This is one of the reasons why we wanted to be people who were grounded in God's word this year. We wanted to be the kind of people who are going to know the scriptures in a way, not just so that they can influence us, though, yes. Not just so that they can shape us and form us, though, yes. But so that we can be the kind of people who can help others when they are lost, when they are confused, when they are in despair, when they don't know what to do. When they're confronted with the realities of the world and don't understand how God is moving or not moving in them. That's the invitation of the Christian is to be able to teach. And by the way, you might go like, hold on, this has got to be an elder only thing, right? Don't you have to have some kind of special degree or like some anointing oil put on you or something? The answer is no. What's the Great Commission say? That thing that unfortunately maybe applies to everyone. Go into all nations, make disciples, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching teaching them to observe all the things that I've commanded you. So all the things that Jesus said is taking those things and being able to give them away. That's what teaching is. And we're to be people who can teach. And elders must be able to teach. And that doesn't mean preach. That doesn't mean standing up with a microphone. It means being able to sit across the table from someone, to sit across the table from your kids and be able to articulate the beauty and the power of the gospel from the word. Because it changes you. It changes people. Verse 6 says, He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. There's a ton of side stuff there that I can't go in there. Basically, and this kind of is maybe the most, of course, thing of the whole list, is, yeah, you don't want someone in leadership who, I don't know, just got on the team, just learned the basic tenets of the faith. You kind of want someone who has some roots, right? This is basically saying you don't want seedlings, you want people who got roots. So let's be people with roots. Let's grow roots into the ground. Verse 7, lastly, the spiritual life. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into the snare of the devil. This means that Christians, mature Christians, leaders, Christian leaders are to have a good reputation with people outside the church. The reputation inside the church is also visible outside the church. This is actually about integrity. This is the fact that we match. That when you're here on Sunday morning, or, or you're at work, or you're in your neighborhood, or you're at home, you match. Who you are there matches who you are here. It's not one thing at the office, not one thing at the prayer meeting. We don't have prayer meetings, but, you know. It's someone who's no one's going, wait, he's an elder? Really? Are you sure? Really? Or, she's a Christian? Really? Are you sure? A good reputation with outsiders. And again, there's a whole sermon around what that could mean, but that's the invitation. Not that everyone will agree, because goodness me, that's not going to be the case. But that the reputation of how we be would be good. Respected. Anyone who does business with you, anyone who does a hobby with you would say that makes sense that you're a Christian leader. Yes, that's an elder, of course. All that Paul's done here is just to put a progressive, to put what progressive sanctification is supposed to lead us to look like. As I said, there's no elite special forces people, there's just people. No one's beyond the rest of us. No, it's just what mature faith looks like. And the good news is, if you're feeling what you're probably feeling, which is, 
That's a lot of list things. As we go back a couple weeks to the reality of the life in the Spirit, is that we want to do these things, right? That the Spirit of God leans us towards them, and we want these things to be true in us, and by His power, they can progressively be so. And so there's, there's two ways in which that, that plays us up. There's, well, there's two options of where you go from here. You either go like, that's a lot of stuff, and I don't think that I'm going to be able to be those things, and so I'm just going to peace out. Or, or you can look at one of those things, and maybe the Spirit was kind of, you know, like pulling on you on one of these elements, and you're looking at them, and you're saying, okay, you know what? Maybe, maybe God's inviting me to step towards this. Maybe there's an area of repentance. Maybe there's actually just a curiosity to ask the people in my life, hey, out of this grouping of things, what do you see as the truest thing about me on the positive, and what do you see as maybe one of the truer things about me on the negative side? That we may become more alive, celebrating the beauty and power of God who God's made us, and also more humble and repentant about the things that aren't true yet. That's how we become progressively more sanctified in Christ. That's what the Spirit does in us, if, you, if we let him. So that's who elders are. And briefly, I'm just going to go through now, it, and that's who what it, mature Christians are. And, and there are many mature Christians in our church. There are people that, that live this out, and I experience this from you. And it's awesome. And you are able to teach, and you do. And you do encourage, and you're not prone to anger, and you are humble. It's awesome. Now, what do elders do? And for this, I'm going to take us to 1 Peter 5, which we'll read in a couple of weeks. 1 Peter 5 says, So I exhort the elders among you, this is Peter saying, as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, he says to the elders, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not with compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you. Not, not, not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Not domineering over those in your charge, but being an example to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. It's really three predominant, three fundamental what's of the elder. What do elders do? And first is the elder shepherd. And because none of us are real shepherds, it can be like shepherd, cane, sheep, what? It just means that we're talking about guarding, leading, and directing a group of men and women that are part of a community while caring for them individually. Think about Jesus talking about being a good shepherd, right? The, the good shepherd leaves the 99 in order to go out for the one. It's caring for the 99 and caring for the one. And shepherding the community, which means shepherding the individual as well. It's taking a group of people to a safe place where they can grow and flourish. And so at RCC, we believe that our elders are supposed to be devoted to prayer. That's part of what shepherding looks like, is to pray for you. And we pray for your marriages, and we pray for your families, and we pray for your spiritual life, and we pray for you individually in some of your sicknesses, when you lost a job or you're underemployed. And we pray for you. We ask the divine power of God to come in and have effect and impact on you. And the more you let us know of the ways we can pray for you, the, we pray for you. And so some of you are like, are awesome. You're like, eh. Others of you are like, I'm not telling them. I don't know what they'll think of me. It's okay. We love you, and we love praying. I believe the power of God is unleashed in prayer. Elders are supposed to care for people when they're in need. And some of you guys have been in need, and you, and you know what that's looked like. A shepherd is supposed to protect people by looking out for and confronting dangers that are within and the dangers that are without. For us to be the kind of people that guard against external and internal threats to the church, looking out for them being present and aware to them, whether it's philosophies, methodologies, theologies, or, or people. Like we've had to, some of you guys know this, but most of you don't, like we've had to take on people that were like disruptive or destructive or disunifying to our church. And some of them like very directly, they're tearing things apart, tearing people apart. 
RC Elder Board is determined and determines the need for church discipline. That's another thing that a shepherd does. How it's to be executed, and of course, always for the purpose of restoration of the sinner, to preserve and protect the body, and to reconcile believers. And we've done a bunch of that. Marriages, families. So there's, there's, a, there's a shepherding component. And then there's also, Paul says, and Peter says, exercising oversight. That means looking at the church, and seeing, okay, is this working? Is this working? Are we all heading in the same direction? This, this is governance. This is oversight, looking over for the purpose of moving the church in the direction that God's given. So the board's responsible to, to establish vision and direction and, and focus, how we're going to spend our time and energy, our, our resources, to watch over the church and ensuring that RCC is like moving in the same direction together, the kind of direction that we've agreed upon, that we sense God is leading us into. We also determine what, who does what, how decisions are made, the kind of policies that are going to guide our church, and then how is the resources, people, money, going to be allocated and, and distributed and, and used. Now, again, I may be posting, we have an actual document that outlines all the roles and responsibilities of elders. It's actually really important, I think, for you to know that, and I'll get to that in a minute as to why. But I'll be posting that, and that's some of what I'm reading from is some of those elements and pieces. So over, exercising oversight, so shepherding, exercising oversight. So again, if you, you can have too much, you can have shepherding. It's like, hey, we're always trying to care for people, but we have no plans, no structures, no methodology, no direction. We're just, we really, really love people. And it needs to be both. It can't just be an executive board that's just passing policies without shepherding and leading and moving towards the people. It, can't, it has to be both of those things. That's what it means to lead and shepherd and be Christian in, in the work of the Christian leader and the work of the elder. And the third is, is teaching sound doctrine setting the theological and, and uh, doctrinal boundaries for the church. As Titus 1.9, which is a parallel passage to the First Timothy passage we read earlier, he says, elders must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction and in sound doctrine and also rebuke those who, are, who, con who contradict it. This means that the board of elders is leads, teaches, and guards, and loves according to sound doctrine, according to the fundamental reality of our statement of faith, according to the ways in which we've worked those out, as well as training people to increase in their love and their knowledge and their trust of God. Our responsibility is to teach about what we're going to talk about on Sunday morning and what we're going to equip people in. So here at RCC, it means that we've drawn boundaries, that we are theologically reformed, that we believe in the gifts of the Spirit. Now here at RCC, we're going to teach about areas of gender and sexuality that may not be exactly what everyone else thinks. We're going to teach about and hold to areas of the authority of Scripture or the nature of Christ. It's the elder's responsibility, empowered by the Spirit of God, to determine how it's going, how we're going to work out all these theological and doctrinal realities in the gray areas of life. And elders are supposed to do this with joy. Not because they have to, not under compulsion, not lording it over as we talked about earlier, not, not using power for, for gain, not to try and make money, though I'm not exactly sure how elders are make money, but not to try and make more money, but for the purpose of, de of delivering the body of Christ, of presenting the people of God into the very context and the very way that God has designed and redeemed them to be. So lastly, I just want to talk about how do we respond. So we've got this, this picture of what a Christian leader looks like, what mature Christianity looks like, that we all aspire and move into, and that's the first thing, that we aspire. How do we respond to aspire? Look at that list. It's not a list. It's a, it's a character picture. It's a, it's a framework of what it means to be alive to Christ. Some of you aspire to the actual office of elders. Yes, do so. It says right there in the scripture, aspire to that. And we all aspire to mature character in God as he invites us each. Second is, is pray. 
I, um, there are some of you that are awesome and you text and you, and you, and you, you pray for the leadership. It's, it is, it is, it can be heavy. It is heavy. It can be. That's like so, it's heavy. There's a, there's a lot, there's a lot of wisdom necessary. There's times where we don't know what to do exactly or what the best way to go about it is. The controversies, there's things that go on that we're having to, to discern things. So just pray, pray for wisdom, for discernment, for unity, for clarity in the spirit, for vision, for integrity, that those things would continue to be true. Please pray. How else do you respond? You hold accountable. Elders are not untouchable people. Christian leaders are not untouchable people. And actually, the moment it seems like they're untouchable people, there's a deeper problem. None of us are untouchable. We're not perfect people. We're not a perfect board. We make decisions that sometimes don't pan out the way we thought they would. One of the ways, there's a great example. A few years ago, you remember we were building out the building. We made a big declaration. I remember because I said it. I was like, hey, we are not going to spend more than this much. I was like, blah. And then like a few, couple, a few months later, after we built out this place, we came back and we we're like, we spent a little more. And it was like, and you know what happened? We had a few people that were like, uh, yes, you, you, you said this was the line. How, how come we spent more? Can you explain? Can you, we, we want to trust you, but, but you said, so can you explain why not? And it was like, yeah, that's right and fitting. You should hold us accountable. We said, we drew a line. If you're going to trust us, then we can explain why something is different than it was. Elders need to be held accountable by the membership for who they are, for how they're leading, and whether they're being faithful to the mission and the vision of the church. It's fitting to ask, are the elders leading? Are they loving? Are they shepherding well? It's a fitting thing to ask. If you're experiencing something from a, a Christian leader, if from an elder that is not fitting with this category, it should be brought to their attention. It should be brought to the rest of the board's attention. We have humble men on the board. We have a humble staff team and leaders. So hold accountable. Next one is submit. Just gotta love those being back to back though, right? Hebrews 13, 17, I don't have to say this, Hebrews says it. Obey your leaders and submit to them. For they are, for the, listen to this. For they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Like that's, that's the weight. It's the sense of, is your soul well? It's the sadness and the, and the pain when people walk away from the faith or, or dissipate or tear apart a marriage contrary to biblical principles. It's weighty. Let them do this, this keeping watch over your souls. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning. For that would be no advantage to you. <laughs> I, I love the logic in this, in this section. I can't go into it. We don't have time for it. But it's just fantastic. It's like, help me help you. It's basically, it's just, it's, it's all that this is. Like, help me help you. Okay? So like, like what this means is, is don't grumble. Please don't grumble. We won't all always agree on, on what the emphasis should be on how the priorities and the processes for ministry should play themselves out. That's a given. Elders and leaders must be open to listen and to hear suggestions, and I believe we are. Consider different perspectives, yes. But in the end, the burden of leadership means that leadership needs to lead, and leadership needs to decide. And according to the scriptures, we are all invited to submit. Elders, we have to submit to each other. And lastly, choose humility. The First Peter passage closes beautifully when it says, clothe yourselves, all of you. That's Christian leaders. That's members. That's believers towards one another. With humility towards one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. That's the invitation. 
You want to know how to respond? This is the invitation. You know how I'm invited to respond? How the elders clothe ourselves with humility. Believing that God can do what he wants to do, that, that we aren't the final answer to all things, that, that with humility, with our knees bent, we need to lead the church, that, that we praying and believing that God wants to do good things through his church, through his local body and the mission God's called us into would be for and would be, be encouraging and be also asking questions at times and that the purposes of God would be accomplished in our midst. So this morning, we come to the table we come to this meal. We take this every week. If you're new, this is every week we come to this table. And, and as I was thinking about it, I thought, you know what's amazing? Is um, like we have a true and better elder, right? We have the ultimate pastor, the ultimate overseer, the ultimate shepherd. And you know what he did? He clothed himself with humility for you and for me. Like he, he gave himself, he sacrificed himself so that you would be made alive, so that I would be made alive in, in him. And so as you come and as you receive this, let us, let us submit ourselves to one another. Let us submit ourselves to Christ. Let us believe that he has good purposes and let us believe that he's the one who's going to bring about these kind of characteristics in us by the power of his spirit. So maybe as you come, receive the body and the blood of Christ and, and submit yourself once again to his purposes in your life for your good. Let's pray. Father, you're the one who has decided how things should work and run. In your wisdom, in your perfect, dis perfect discretion, perfect wisdom, perfect love, you have made and you have established ways for your people, your church, your fam the family of God to be able to, to operate, to live together, to love together, to grow together. And so, Lord, we want to uh, submit ourselves to you. Lord, we, just, we just read through a whole bunch of things. We just heard a, a whole bunch of descriptions of characteristics that, that, are, that are to be true of us, and we want them to be true of us in increasing measure. And so we ask, Lord, by the power of your Spirit, would you make it true of us? Would you make us freer, more alive men and women? Would you allow, even as we take these elements for us to be humbled all the way down to the ground by the beauty and power and majesty of your love for us and your sacrifice for us as our true good shepherd, elder, chief elder. And one day it says that you're going to come back and there's going to be glory. And Lord, we can't wait for that day. So until that day, we receive these elements with joy and uh, we expect great things from you through your church and in Christ Jesus. Amen. Well, if you belong to Jesus, this is your meal. The body of Christ broken and his blood shed for you. So come, welcome to Jesus Christ.